Thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon for our annual awards lunch at the American Academy of Diplomacy. I welcome you very warmly on behalf of Ron and the Academy staff and the board. It's a delight to have you. Let me also say how pleased we are that John Sullivan is not only joining us and honoring us with his presence and will have a few remarks to say, but is the essential cog in being our host. Without John Sullivan, you don't get the eighth floor. <laughs> Thank you, John, very, very much. A word from our caterer. He or she says, please eat your salads with intensity because when this portion of the program is over, your salads will be taken away and something else will appear in their place. I have just a few remarks before I introduce John Sullivan. We've had a very busy year at the Academy and we want in particular to thank those members who are leaving our board. First, Tibor Naj, who as you all know has returned to active duty here as the Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. Uh, Nancy Powell, who is stepping down, and Arlene Rinder and Patrick Theros, who are at the end of their second terms on the board. Could I have just a small but intense round of applause for them? Thank you very much. And we have lost members, as we always do, and we lost some very good friends this year. Frank Carlucci, George Landau, and Princeton Lyman. And could I please ask for a moment of silence in their memory and honor? Thank you very much. The Academy had a good election this year, selecting 22 new members, uh, with a record turnout in the election of 167 members voted. That's, of course, in our members' election, not the by-election. And we have a number of excellent new members, and I'm sure that Ron will be sending those around to you, and I will not, at this stage, read the list. But they are great, and they will be, in many ways, the part of a significant new generation for us. The Academy, in its role uh, as the promoter and defender of American diplomacy, has never been more needed or more recognized. Uh, we welcome you all, new members, to our work and to our number. And if there are new members here joining us for lunch, might they please stand up? It's now my pleasure to rec recognize a few special guests at the head table. Uh, Deputy Secretary Sullivan, whom I mentioned just a moment ago, our co-host. The awardee for the Annenberg Excellence in Diplomacy Award, Secretary James Baker, who could not be with us, but we welcome his son, Douglas B. Baker, in his place. And I hope, Douglas, you will once again convey our regards, respects, and congratulations to your father in winning this important award, the highest that we have to offer. Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, Ambassador David Hale, Acting Deputy Under Secretary of State for Management and Director General, Ambassador William Bill Todd, Deputy Director of the Foreign Service Institute, Ambassador Julieta Noyes. And let me turn the page over. We're not finished yet. We are finished, thank you. In this particularly important time, uh, we have come to realize at the Academy that it will be and continue to be a major test for us. Uh, diplomacy is an important part of our national existence and it remains a centerpiece of what we are doing and is under stress and test perhaps as never before. The Academy has achieved real stature in town and beyond as a defender of strong professional foreign service and State Department. 
we must either continue to grow to further our mission or contract to preserve our slender funds. I believe there's no alternative. We have to expand. Next year, we will be making a major push and beyond. David Welch and Linda Thomas-Greenfield have agreed to head our development committee for this particular effort. Diplomacy is not in the giving criteria, if I can phrase it this way, of major foundations or corporations who play a role in the eleemosynary world. Uh, we are new to them and in some ways quite different. It is, however, central to the lives that we have and continue to live, uh, all of us here in this room. And I ask that when we approach you, you will respond generously uh, in terms of the effort we are making to put the Academy on a more sustained and financially solid footing. It's now my pleasure, if he is working on his salad, I hope he will continue, to introduce John J. Sullivan. John J. Sullivan was confirmed by the United States Senate and sworn in as Deputy Secretary of State <clears throat> on May 24, 2017. He served as Acting Secretary of State from April 1st to April 26, 2018. Prior to assuming office, Mr. Sullivan was a partner in Meyer Brown LLP and co-chair of the law firm's national security practice. From 2010 to 2016, he was chairman of the U.S.-Iraq Business Dialogue, a governmental advisory committee on United States economic relations with Iraq. In addition to his decades of experience in private law practice, Mr. Sullivan has served in two prior administrations in senior positions at, at the Justice, Defense, and Commerce Departments. He served until 2009 as the Deputy Secretary of Commerce, following his service from 2005 to 2007 as the General Counsel of the Commerce Department. Previously, he was appointed Deputy Con General Counsel of the Defense Department by Secretary Donald H. Rumsfeld. In the first Bush administration, Mr. Sullivan was counselor to the Assistant Attorney General J. Michael Luttig in the Justice Department's Office of Legal Counsel, which as you know, is <clears throat> in many ways the final authority in the Defense Department on the law. A native of Boston, Massachusetts, Mr. Sullivan received his bachelor's degree from Brown University and his law degree from the Columbia University School of Law where he was Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar and Book Reviews Editor of the Columbia Law Review. Mr. Sullivan was Law Clerk for Associate Justice David H. Souter of the Supreme Court of the United States and for Judge John Minor Wisdom of the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. And without further ado, John, it's my pleasure to welcome you. But before you get to the stage, let me tell you what a pleasure and honor it has been working with you from time to time on problems that I hope we, working together with others, can solve in the interest of our diplomacy in the State Department. My pleasure to see you, and thank you again. Thank you, Ambassador. Pickering for that, uh, that kind introduction. Uh, thank you also to Ambassador Newman, uh, President of the Academy, uh, and welcome to all of our guests. Back, most of you, to the Department of State. Uh, many friends I see here. I'm delighted to uh, be a co-host for, for today's lunch. Uh, I, was, I was mentioning to Ambassador Newman that I, uh, in anticipation of this lunch today, I went back and looked at the history of the Academy, and it was founded in 1983, and uh, the, uh, the principal uh, actors in found, founding it were Ellsworth Bunker, U. Alexis Johnson, and in the history I was reading, it, it mentioned an assistant secretary of war. And I thought, who would that? So I went and I looked it up, and in fact, it was John McCloy. And I pointed that out to somebody earlier uh, today. I said, can you imagine? That's like referring to Babe Ruth as George Ruth, a, some baseball player from, uh, from Baltimore, right? I mean, John McCloy was the establishment back in the day, right? I mean, he was Assistant Secretary of War under, uh, under Roosevelt and, uh, and Truman involved in uh, very important decisions during the war, but then 
Uh, he was uh, an administrator in uh, post-war West Germany, chairman of the Chase Manhattan Bank, partner at Milbank Tweed. I understand from Ambassador Newman, which is the outside counsel to the academy, which then led me to make the connection that I was in a summer associate back in 1983 at Milbank Tweed, and this will show you how much of a nerd I am and a, and a fanboy of American diplomats and this academy. As a summer associate, I sought out John McCloy, who still had an office at the firm, he was in his mid-80s at this point, and had the temerity to walk into his office and introduce myself to him, and he was so gracious. And I look back on that now, and I'm so uh, grateful that I took that opportunity to meet a person who had been such, a, uh, such an important part of U.S. history, U.S. diplomacy, and a co-founder of this, uh, this great academy. I'll also mention that one of the charter members of the Academy back in 1983 was my uncle, Ambassador Bill Sullivan. So my family was involved in the, uh, in the creation of this, uh, this Academy. So it's my great honor to be here uh, with you today uh, and to, uh, to thank you for all you do for the work of this Academy, the founder's vision uh, of, of this Academy, providing uh, insight to those of us currently in office uh, from those who had major responsibilities and experience in prior administrations, applying those lessons to, uh, to our current problems is, is invaluable. And, and as I thought of it, it's, it's really self-evident. In many ways, it's biblical, right? Ecclesiastes, there's no new thing under the sun, right? You have all seen and done things here, all of you, that we're going through now. Many of us are reinventing the wheel and so forth, but being able to call on you, your experiences, as I've been able to do, whether it's with Ambassador Pickering, Ambassador Newman, Ambassador Grossman, many of you here in this room that I've, uh, I've imposed on for your, for your counsel. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that. The department is grateful for that, and which is why it's important that we, uh, we host the Academy here and commend the Academy for its dedication, for the resources and tools that it provides uh, to American diplomats uh, at the State Department and those representing the United States across, across the federal government. Outreach programs like the, uh, the Arthur Ross discussions in Charlottesville, the Ambassadors Forum in Omaha are important uh, tools in helping keep this department uh, as prepared as it possibly can be in representing the United States abroad. So again, thank you for your important work. And on behalf of the Department of State, I want to congratulate the honorees today. Uh, and without further ado, I've, one thing I've learned from calling on all of your experiences uh, to try to keep it short and not stand between uh, guests and their lunch. So enjoy. Thank you, John, very much on behalf of all of us for the succinctness and for the kind words about the Academy. Uh, I'm very delighted to uh, have you here with us today and hope that you will be able to stay with us as long as your schedule permits in that regard. I should only say one other thing. I learned very quickly when I was ambassador to Israel that a former chief of staff of the Israeli army uh, had a saying, stand up to be appreciated, speak up to be heard, and sit down to be honored. This is a tactic that I learned from my master, Tom Pickering, who explained to me that clinking glasses doesn't mean much to people, but they were all indoctrinated in youth so that when you say shh, they actually become quiet. And I've discovered that it works. I apologize almost for starting the actual program, because I've discovered over the years that we all have a really good time talking to each other when we, when we get here, and I always feel slightly guilty when I have to, ha have to open the program, but I do. Um, we asked all the, Tom asked all the new members to stand, so I'm not gonna do them that again, but uh, thank you and welcome uh, to our ranks, to the new members. First of all, I want to thank uh, Maria Raisaus and Destiny Clements from my office. We had a total staff turnover this summer. 
Maria took, many of you knew Isabel, Maria, Maria took Isabel's place with scarcely a missed beat and Destiny has done a great job taking over the manifold functions held previously by Summer Minden and you all wouldn't have ever made it in this building if they hadn't been working hard, so please give them a round of applause. I want to thank Aileen Place from the Office of Public Engagement, whose help once again makes this effort possible. Uh, she's been an incredible help to us and ma just making things seamless as we work. Thanks also to Nick Needham, our intern, and Destiny's friend Kelly O'Keefe, who gets absolutely nothing out of this except a free meal and who volunteered to help. Um, I have one actual atom of business. We have uh, selected the board, has selected new members of the board to replace several who are leaving. The new members are Ann Patterson, Christy Kenny, Frank Taylor, and Chuck Cobb. And could I have a motion from somebody to approve the board's choice because the membership has to vote on that. So, so move. excellent. All in favor say aye. aye. Any damn fool who wants to oppose say no. <laughs> um, no, seriously, thank you. Uh, but we, we did need to conclude that item. Uh, we have had a very busy year. At the program committee, Deborah McCarthy has been busy with her own podcast, The General and the Ambassador, and working with Pete Romero as he and Laura Bennett in, uh, have turned out one episode after another of a parallel podcast called American Diplomat. We are working to get these out into mid-America to reach non-traditional audiences. I suspect the number of people who listen to podcasts in this group may be limited, but there is a very large, bigger audience out there, and we are working, and with the generosity of the Una uh, Chalkman Cox Foundation, we're gonna be expanding that program into a second year and getting some real professional help to move it out. We continue speaking about important issues and the importance of diplomacy in our recurring programs, the University of Nebraska at Omaha, Texas Tech, Cisco Forum, the Jefferson Foundation at Monticello. We began a new effort to explain diplomacy at the high school level with a program at Hotchkiss. It's a wonderful school. I was up there to start the program, and some of their students are with us today, as is their uh, teacher, instructor, David Thompson. We welcome them here to the Academy. Uh, if any of them are with you, please do make them welcome. Although if you haven't made them welcome by this point, you can hardly talk to them because we're having the program. Um, we have a new program on security training for ambassadors and DCMs, which is close to wrapping up, creating scenarios to actually help train ambassadors to think about long-term security issues. We, the department has amazing programs on crisis management and what to do once everything goes to hell. What we have never had is a way of training ambassadors to think about problems before they go there and to make the risk-benefit kind of trade-offs they have to do. And we're working on creating a number of scenarios with the McCain Institute and Arizona State University that will help you can't train people, I won't say training, because these things never replicate, but you can help teach people how to begin to think about them. And that's something we've never done before. Uh, FSI has been monitoring, we're back, be back to see them soon. Um, we've also got a new program going, looking for additional ways. Uh, we'll, we'll be coming back to the department with some ideas on another program. We're looking for additional ways to speak to the public about the nature of diplomacy, which many prize, but few understand. So new ideas are welcome, especially if you'd like to work on them. Um, we've had some intensive work with Congress on a variety of issues. Uh, Lauren Craner and Mike Van Dusen have been heading that effort. Uh, we have a revitalized congressional committee we need now to think about how to target our influence in the interest of strengthening professional diplomacy, something I believe that accords with Secretary Pompeo's desires. Uh, is Ted McNamara here today? I was, Ted, do you want to take just a moment to talk about where the Diplomacy Foundation is? I thought I should give you a second before we... 
I didn't preview this with you, but I thought we should give you just a second while we're here. Otherwise, Bill Harrop will roll over in his grave. Uh, and he's not even here. Thanks. I'm used to pulling up the tail end of this meeting, uh, so I'm uh, not, not fully prepared for this location. Uh, first of all, I'm uh, very appreciative of, uh, of Ron's offer to brief you on where we are with the diplomacy. That better? Oh, yeah, much better. Even I can hear me now. Uh, the Diplomacy Center has uh, finished a, a great year, and I uh, want to start, before I get into that aspect, to offer my thanks at long range to one of our first, our most enthusiastic, help, most helpful, and most, uh, most generous benefactors. And he happens to be the guest of honor awardee today. Secretary Baker, and I hope that you'll uh, take back with you uh, to him our enormous gratitude and thanks for all he's done for the Diplomacy Center. Now to the more day-to-day uh, -day activity. I said 19, or excuse me, 20, uh, 2018 has been a very successful year. I can report that the Diplomacy Center is up and running. Now, most of you will say, oh, what do you mean? That's empty, I've been through that. Uh, fortunately, uh, I can point to the Diplomacy Center as half of the Diplomacy Center is a museum, the other half is an education program. In the last year, we've brought over 7,000 high school seniors and uh, undergraduate college students to the center for programming that would enhance their understanding of diplomacy and obviously their interest in diplomacy, possibly as careers. We've done that not only here in Washington at the center, but we've reached out to uh, states all across the country, from the Northeast to the Southwest. And uh, those 7,000 students will be followed by, we expect this coming year, in over 8,000, and we'll just keep growing. Our anticipation is well over 10 to 15, somewhere between 10 and 15,000 students a year when we're fully up and running. But I can report to you that we are up and running. The second thing we've done is uh, over the past few years, two or three years, we've trained about 4,000 high school teachers and college teachers in how to run the types of programs for diplomacy that we're running and to do them on their own on campus, which is an exponential increase in the numbers. In fact, in the 7,000, I don't include all of those that were run by the, the people we've trained. So we're training the trainers and then reaching out beyond them to expand the knowledge of and the, uh, and the importance of diplomacy around the country. And at a time when uh, diplomacy is under fire, at a time when the American public doesn't understand diplomacy, at a time when uh, our, our, our diplomacy is under, uh, under attack in many respects, it's very important that we reach out beyond Washington to uh, John Q. and Mary Q. Citizen and their family for at least a basic understanding of the essential role of diplomacy in American life and in American international affairs. The, uh, the final remark I'll make is that I'm, as you know, many of you, in fact, I think almost all of you have received a packet from me uh, threatening you with a phone call. Uh, I've succeeded in threatening some of you directly and the others I'll be seeing you in the next, or at least talking to you, I hope, in the next few months. I do need your support. We do need your support. The foundation needs the leadership of American diplomacy to speak out in support of the Diplomacy Center. And not just to speak out, but also to contribute. And I appeal to you for a contribution. 
whatever you can do. Many of you, as I look around the room, have done an enormous amount already. Uh, but uh, many of you, uh, I hope, can do more. And in the course of the next year, we'll be focusing in on particularly the career leaders. We've gotten an enormously favorable response from many of our uh, political appointee colleagues. Uh, now, admittedly, the, uh, the finances of, uh, of those who didn't spend their career in diplomacy is going to exceed those who did devote their entire career to diplomacy. But nonetheless, I think there's enough in this room right now that we could make a substantial contribution. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ron. Thank you very much. You see in this the uh, insidious intertwining of all the various uh, non-profit, uh, non non-governmental uh, organizations in Washington dealing with foreign affairs. Uh, Tom has mentioned our own fundraising. Tom has mentioned our own fundraising. I won't go over that again. I do want to say that I am grateful for the support of the recurring friends of the Academy, the Una Chapman Cox Foundation, the Delavon Foundation, Garda Federal Services, and Johnson Hanson, who continue to keep us in business. Um, and now we come to the major event, the Annenberg Award. And this is our annual award for excellence in diplomacy. I don't quite know why Secretary Baker wasn't honored this way some time back. Um, he somehow escaped us. I'm not quite sure who's responsible for that, but I'm sure it goes back to people before me. <laughs> anyway, I could spend a long time telling you about Secretary Baker, who many of you actually know, but instead I'm just going to remind you of a few highlights, that he was Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, twice served as White House Chief of Staff, led an unprecedented five presidential campaigns. But I think in this building we will always think of him as one of the most effective Secretaries of State of the post-World War II period. There is more in the program uh, for you to read, but I'd rather let you hear from Secretary Baker, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but we do have him on screen. Mario, where are you? You're in charge. Um, and we do have some remarks from him. And let's see, should I do that before? Let's let him speak, and then Douglas, if I could get you to come up and present the award. Members of the Academy, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, now in my 89th year, I'm trying to cut back on my schedule. So I hope you will understand why I am doing this via video. In a moment, I want to say a few words about American leadership on the world stage. But first, let me thank the American Academy of Diplomacy for this award. Named after two remarkable Americans, both of whom I admired and considered friends. Walter and Lee Annenberg exemplified the generous and enduring American nature that has helped make our nation strong and resilient. Of course, tonight would not have been possible for me had I not worked for President George H.W. Bush, who history will remember, I am sure, as our nation's very best one-term president and one of the best presidents of all time. No president understood diplomacy and foreign affairs any better than President Bush. As the first U.S. ambassador to China, director of the CIA, and vice president, his resume immaculately prepared him for the job. By the time he assumed the Oval Office, he understood both the big picture as well as the subtle nuance of what became one of the most dramatic four years in world history, as the Cold War ended with a whimper rather than with a bang. Along the way, he assembled a national security team that worked together on the delicate issues of the day rather than squabbling with one another like so many others have. Brent Scowcroft, Dick Cheney, and I 
may have had occasional differences, and we did, but we usually resolved them without having to ask our boss to referee. We all sang from the same hymnal, which meant that our allies and our adversaries clearly understood U.S. policy and couldn't twist differences to their own advantage. There's never been a doubt in my mind that a main reason for any success I had as Secretary of State was because I enjoyed a seamless relationship with my president, a friend of 60 years and one whose political campaigns I managed. And so President Bush deserves much of the credit for tonight's award. Ladies and gentlemen, to judge by what we see in the media, the era of American international leadership is nearing an end. There is talk of a new American isolationism and indeed the collapse of the liberal international order. But I'm not so sure. Perhaps my age gives me some perspective. I can remember that long struggle of the Cold War when peace between the United States and the Soviet Union precariously rested on the promise of mutually assured destruction. Trust me, the good old days were nothing of the kind. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the world experienced a period some has defined as America's unipolar moment, one marked by relative stability as democracy spread across the globe and international trade flourished. Today, however, we appear to have entered a new period of marked international instability. Several trends are driving this phenomenon. The rise of China has fundamentally altered the global balance of economic and increasingly military power. Russia has returned decisively to the world stage, flexing its muscle in Ukraine, in Syria, and elsewhere. Europe is beset with issues of internal governance, including immigration policy, the future of the euro, Brexit, and backsliding on democratic norms in some Eastern European countries. In the, in the Middle East, events are being driven by a burgeoning competition between Iran and Saudi Arabia for influence in the Persian Gulf and beyond. And here in the United States, partisan wrangling has reached new and crippling heights of rancor. Let me make one vital point at the outset. The United States cannot retreat from the world stage. We have too much at stake. We did not create the current system of military alliances and trade agreements from some theoretical commitment to multilateralism. We acted to avoid another devastating Great Depression and another catastrophic world war among the great powers. And we were successful because our interests in peace and prosperity converged with those of partners in Western Europe, in Asia, and elsewhere. The United States and the world have benefited mightily from this historic endeavor. Any U.S. exit from this system would lead to greater economic and strategic instability. We would see a rise in conflict as regional powers jostle for influence in the wake of U.S. withdrawal. And we would experience a surge in beggar thy neighbors policies as the rules-based liberal trade and investment regime would erode. Either of those unfortunate developments would directly undermine the safety and the well-being of Americans. Isolationism, therefore, is simply not an option for our long-term global security and well-being. But a recalibration of our foreign policy is certainly in order. As Walter Lippmann wrote in 1943, foreign policy consists in bringing into balance with a comfortable surplus of power in reserve the nation's commitments and the nation's power. As we attempt to recalibrate U.S. foreign policy, we should consider a few rules of thumb for effective diplomacy. 
First, Teddy Roosevelt was right. We should generally speak softly and carry a big stick. There is a time and a place for tough public talk, even with allies. But much of the important work of diplomacy is best done in private. The object is not to score public debating points. It is to secure good arrangements, advantageous to the United States. Second, we must be careful in picking our fights. Otherwise, any U.S. administration risks squandering its international influence and domestic political capital. Third, we should always remember the big picture. It is sometimes better to yield on small issues if it increases the odds of success in more important ones. Negotiations do not take place in isolation. They occur in a broader context. And lastly, we should recall that not all negotiations are zero-sum. Indeed, the most successful agreements are based upon mutual advantage. As you might imagine, I've been called a lot of things during my many years in the public eye, some good and some bad, but woolly-headed idealist is not one of them. I am a staunch internationalist for a very simple reason. I believe that U.S. engagement in the international arena is vital to the security, the prosperity, and the liberty of the American people. There is nothing wrong with national self-interest. Indeed, its promotion is the sine qua non of effective foreign policy. But that self-interest should be enlightened. It should look beyond immediate narrow advantage in this or that negotiation. Let me finish these remarks on a note of optimism. I realize that today this is unfashionable, but I remain firmly upbeat about the future of the world and of the United States of America. Surely problems abound, but we should remember that by most important criteria, we are living in a golden age for humanity. Extreme global poverty has declined precipitously. People live longer. Far fewer of their children die in infancy. The United States may not possess the unrivaled power that it did, say, in the immediate aftermath of the Cold War, but it remains by a substantial margin the most powerful country in the world and we must recalibrate our use of that power to reflect new realities. As Abraham Lincoln once said, as our case is new, so we must think anew and act anew. His wise admonition is as true today as it was when he expressed it more than 150 years ago. Thank you all very much. Well, I'm, I'm only sorry that we can't express directly to Secretary Baker our obvious appreciation for those very thoughtful remarks, but Doug, I hope you'll express to him that the audience was generally, uh, generously appreciative. Uh, Doug, if I could ask you to come up and thank you again for taking your father's place here. Let me read, if I may, this citation. Uh, this is the Walter and Leonore Annenberg Award for Excellence in Diplomacy for 2018, presented by the American Academy of Diplomacy, is awarded to James A. Baker III. A foremost American diplomat of the post-war period, James A. Baker III has presided over a startling number of diplomatic achievements. Among these are his role in the design of a new American foreign policy, after the end of the Cold War to welcome states into the liberal world, the creation of the formidable alliance to liberate Kuwait, the Arab-Israeli Madrid Peace Conference, the bipartisan accord on Central America, and the reunification of Germany. In economic policy, the Plaza Accord was a significant diplomatic accomplishment of his tenure as Secretary of the Treasury. The list of his achievements is long. It is with extraordinary pleasure 
that we extend our highest award to him, the 2018 Walter and Leonor Annenberg Award for Excellence in Diplomacy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Would you like to say anything in this? No, I couldn't do this. Thank you. But thank you for coming and being with us. Now, we have Ambassador Janon Walker. Where are you, Janon? Hiding out someplace. Here, there you are. And if you would please come up, let me pass the podium to the Book Award Committee. By the way, Kate, for those of you who are new, I just don't do introductions of our members because most of you know them, and if you don't, you'll get to know them. Uh, but generally, you do so. I don't spend time on that as a matter of our form. So, Janan, heading the book committee, please. Thank you very much. We had more excellent books submitted to the Dillon Book Committee this year than any time in living memory. And after a lively exchange of emails through the spring and summer, by the time we met last month, it was, it was clear, is this okay? It was clear that, uh, the, closer? It was clear that the winners should be Ben Steele, uh, the Marshall Plan, and the dawn of the Cold War. Ben has written a very complicated book with a huge cast of characters, and much of it is highly technical. But he has a knack for making everything, all the pieces fit together, and it not only intelligible, but fun to read. One of our members uh, described parts of it as a page turner, which is not what one would expect. Uh, uh, it, uh, one could say a lot of wonderful things about the book, but I would like to stress one thing in particular. He makes very clear that the Marshall Plan was not a matter of altruism, but of the pursuit of American national interest. We had leaders who understood not only that we needed prosperous Europeans to buy our goods, but also a prosperous and stable and harmonious Europe as a bulwark against communism and the nationalism that had torn the continent apart before. And they were willing to take on American public opinion. I read once that 14% of the American population, according to one opinion poll, supported the plan at the outset. Uh, it's a terrific read and something uh, we all should be very proud of. And there's a, the citation reads, and I have got something that's easier for me to read here. Uh, ben Steele weaves together the many players, interests, and personalities of an exceptional time in American diplomacy when leaders of vision, courage, and skill, and a highly enlightened concept of America's national interest used all the economic and political tools at America's disposal, not only to help reconstruct Europe as a bulwark against communism, but also to spur reconciliation and integration among West European states themselves, laying the foundation for 70 years of peace in a previously war-torn continent. And somewhere here, there's a check as well. A very modest check then, and the certificate. Thank you so much, Ambassador Walker. Thank you to the committee. It's been a lifelong dream to one day come up on stage and accept an award from the Academy. <laughs> it's every bit as wonderful as I'd imagined it. So thank you for the honor, and thank you all for your service. I'm not quite finished. We didn't choose a runner-up this year, but among the several other very good books is a biography of the late, great American diplomat Llewellyn Thompson by his daughters, Jenny and Sherry. We wanted to take the occasion of that book to honor him in this difficult time for American diplomacy, to honor him and to honor 
fine job his daughters have done reminding us what public service in this country can and should be. So Jenny and Sherry, if the two of you would stand while I read the citation for you, and we have certificates for both of you. It says, the criminology... The Criminologist, a biography of Ambassador Lewin Thompson, Thompson by his two daughters, Jenny and Sherry Thompson, presents a remarkable picture of one of the titans of U.S. diplomacy. He helped shape the modern U.S. role in the world from the early days of his career in Moscow in the 1930s until his retirement in the 1960s. He showed the best of the diplomat's craft as he found ways to understand and to cooperate with some very different Soviet leaders, but especially with Khrushchev. The, publish, the publication of this excellent book is an occasion to celebrate Am Ambassador Thompson's skill and dedication and the participation of his family in his extraordinary diplomatic adventure. the inestimable Ambassador Robert Hunter on stage, there you are, I knew you wouldn't be far, to present two very important awards, the Media Awards. Robert. Thank you very much, Ron. Uh, first, some news out of the White House. Uh, as we meet and as I speak, the President of the United States is pardoning the Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> uh, both of them, actually, uh, peas and carrots. Uh, I'm not going to follow that line of thought any. Uh, last year, you may recall that I talked about our patron here, uh, Benjamin Franklin, and then I went over to see what he was reading, and uh, he was not in great shape because it was the Office of Management Budget submission on the State Department budget. Uh, I'm pleased to say, I understand, that things are looking up for the Foreign Service, a recognition of just how important diplomacy is, and in large part, thanks to uh, uh, the gentleman who was here earlier, John Sullivan, who uh, got things back on track, and which we owe him an added uh, uh, vote of thanks. Uh, now uh, for the awards. Uh, the first one uh, is to uh, uh, Pamela, Constable uh, from the Washington Post. Uh, she's here with uh, the foreign editor of the Washington Post, uh, Doug Jail, uh, who uh, publishes her material and, uh, and keeps us all informed first thing in the morning. Now, I didn't see anything uh, yet on your, uh, your uh, blog about the national turkey, but I'm sure you'll get to that. Now, uh, as we've already heard from the person ahead of the Diplomacy Center and and from uh, Ron. Today is a very special day in addition uh, to the, uh, me th this particular meeting. It is National Giving Day. And I don't know, most of you will have gotten 100 emails this morning asking for money. And I will second, obviously, the money that has to go to diplomatic matters. But I want to say also something else one should give to. It is this particular organization, the Afghan Stray Animal League, which was created by our honoree, uh, Pat Constable, who incidentally, uh, right now, in terms of uh, uh, her constitution, is somewhere half between Kabul and here. Uh, 20 some odd hours ago, she was in Kabul, but uh, we're so delighted she, she could be here with us today. Uh, I want to now read the citation. Uh, Pam, why don't you come on up here, if you would, please? Uh, and. Uh, We'll read the citation and give you a chance to uh, say a few words if you're not asleep by then. But uh, this is fantastic. You came from the farthest today. Uh, since 9-11, we pay belated attention to Afghanistan and its neighbors, the far-flung battle line. Then we knew so little. Now, much more of what we have to know. For this, we thank Pamela Constable. Washington Post bearer chief in South Asia, and now Pakistan and Afghanistan. She roams and reports, often at personal risk, helping us to see, but even more to understand. 
She labors to know context and causes from the sweep of today's most daunting societal and cultural movements to the lives of left out people. Her fragments of grace in Playing with Fire are primers for our times. She graced the pages of the Baltimore Sun and then the Boston Globe, deploying her talent and insight for eight years in Latin America. From Chile to Haiti, East Asia, the former USSR, if there is challenge and crisis, Pam Constable is their educator above all. Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, Uh, here's the award, and if I can get Tom to let go of it, here's the check as well. And I have a W-9 form for my daughter. <laughs> yes, uh, the tax man cometh. Here we are. Uh, congratulations. Thank Would you, you like much. to say a few words? I'll, I'll hold this okay. for you, please. But I get it eventually, right? I don't know if this can actually go low enough for me. Is this low enough for me? You can hear me if, even if you can't see me? All right. I, I often have problem not being able to be seen or heard. That's why I like to write. I'm going to just take a couple of minutes and say a couple of things that are on my mind. Can you hear me okay? Even closer. Okay. I am delighted to be here and very grateful to receive such a distinctive honor, which puts me in the company of many journalists I have admired over the years for their dedicated and insightful reporting on foreign affairs including Tom Ricks, Eugene Robinson, Dana Priest from The Post, as well as Robin Wright, who has left now. I'm also very pleased that The Post's foreign editor, Doug Gell, who has encouraged and guided me and many of these honorees, could be here today as my guest. I suppose this occasion, I'm not repeating what Ben said, almost. I suppose this occasion also puts me in the company of Meryl Streep, or maybe Robert Redford, since it allows me to utter these immortal words, I wish to thank the Academy. <laughs> Unlike that other Academy, however, this one includes a number of individuals that I actually have personally known and respected over the years. Dennis Cooks, Sally Shelton Colby, Alex Watson, Carl Eikenberry, Bill Milam, Ron Newman, and many others. Ron and I, in fact, have missed so many opportunities to meet lately in Afghanistan that I told him I suspected he had arranged this award just so we could finally meet for lunch, which we are going to do tomorrow. Also, this gives me a chance to formally put to rest a long, persistent rumor. Although I do have a first cousin named Eleanor Constable, she is not a member of this organization. I want to mention one more career diplomat who is no longer with us, but whom I came to know when we were both posted in Santiago during the Pinochet years, and with whom I remained friends until his death in 2012. To watch Ambassador Harry Barnes Jr. deal with the tough dictatorship that the Reagan administration was trying to nudge toward democracy was to watch a consummate gentleman play an understated but relentless game of chess. Harry was unfailingly gracious and polite, but he made his mandate very clear, pointedly attending human rights ceremonies, inviting dissidents to the embassy. His role helped to move events steadily toward the night of October 21st, 1988, when Pinochet lost a national referendum after seven years in power and was left with no real option but to leave peacefully. Being a foreign correspondent is not for everyone. A friend once described it as a job where you are always arriving at places with no one to greet you and always leaving places with no one to say goodbye. It is often lonely, uncomfortable, tense, and dangerous. One has to decide within minutes whether to trust a stranger or not, whether to take this road or that. One has to drop into alien territory, sometimes with violence erupting try to figure out what is happening by deadline that evening, explain what is at stake, who is on which side, and to try to spell their names right. <laughs> when I look back at my experiences overseas, there is nothing I would change. Not the long, hot road trips with no showers, the giant spiders on the ceilings, the bruises from falling out of Humvees, 
the eager hosts offering me roast armadillo or yak butter tea. Just the chance to be there, to witness history unfolding in Haiti or Colombia, Ukraine, Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, has been a privilege. How many people get to travel by truck across India with a team of parade elephants, to cross the Khyber Pass next to a camel caravan? How many people got to spend the Millennium Eve on a frigid airport runway in Kandahar, covering a Taliban hijacking, dictating with my fingers frozen to the sat phone while my editor interrupted to say, Happy New Year. Between that and a champagne toast in a ballroom, it was no contest. Doug, my current editor, has often been understandably frustrated with my stubborn technological illiteracy. But he also knows how much I love this work, especially the chance to make the struggles of people in distant lands come alive for American readers as well as policymakers, to explain what is at stake and why it matters. I probably shouldn't say this, but I still can't believe I get paid to do it. There is one aspect, however, that has taken a terrible toll on me and on many of my friends and colleagues in the field. Some people suggest that foreign correspondents are drawn to danger, attracted by the thrill of taking risks, addicted to war. There is some truth to that, but the thrill goes only so far, and the price can be very high. I want to speak briefly about two close friends among the scores of journalists who have lost their lives abroad in the past several years, both of whom died covering the same conflicts as me. One was Elizabeth Neufer, a childhood friend in Connecticut, a longtime colleague at the Boston Globe. She wrote movingly about the plight of people during conflicts in Bosnia, Rwanda. And then, at age 46, she was tragically killed in a highway accident in Iraq soon after the US invasion of 2003. The last time I saw Elizabeth, she told me that her greatest regret was being overseas when her father died. I never forgot that conversation, and it was the main reason I made sure I was home in Connecticut during those final months before my dad passed away only five years ago at age 97. A second close friend died much more recently and I am still trying to come to terms with his death. His name was Samim Faramars. He was a television reporter in Afghanistan, whom I got to know working and traveling on military assignments. But he was much more than a glib, dashing TV journalist. He was a thoughtful, independent-minded young man with great moral courage. He quietly challenged the cultural constraints, the rigid traditions, that have held back his society for so long. Samim was hungry for knowledge and eager to help modernize Afghanistan in more meaningful ways than its growing smartphone addiction. In time, I have no doubt that he would have done so. But just a few weeks ago, on the night of September 5th, Samim was sent out to cover a suicide bombing in Kabul. While he was speaking live from the scene, a second bomb exploded killing him instantly. He was 28 years old. This award is dedicated to him. Thank you. Uh, the final award in the Arthur Ross uh, Media Award, a man who understood that foreign policy to be successful required an informed electorate and uh, ties between uh, uh, what is done at home and what is done abroad. And uh, I think along with Benjamin Franklin, who was also listening, the inspiration we just had from former Secretary Baker is extraordinary. Bipartisan, uplifting, and in fact, uh, I was listening carefully uh, as he finished to what Franklin had to say. He said, yes, it is a republic 
and you are keeping it. Final award now goes to Carol Giacomo of uh, the New York Times. Uh, her guest is uh, Christopher Marquette, who is also a journalist uh, with CQ and Roll Call. And at some point, we fully expect him to be up here getting an award. Uh, oh, incidentally, he has a relationship uh, with the awardee, uh, her son. So in, an, in addition to other things, uh, she'd done good in that department. Uh, in complex times, Carol Giacomo is a trustworthy source of reason and good sense on foreign and defense policy, a reliable guide for America in the world. On the New York Times editorial board since 2007, much of her work is unsigned, but not hidden from those who know her voice and the quality of her wisdom. The vigor, insight, and moral passion of articles she signs, seen as well on the board's taking note in her public speaking and inestimable tweets. In 20 years as diplomatic correspondent at Reuters, Washington, Carol Giacomo set the standard among her peers, a must read in the foreign policy community and is top notch explainer in chief for publics everywhere. A million miler in 100 uh, countries. Let me get the other piece of paper. Here. In 100 countries, as she covered and interpreted eight secretaries of state, she travels the beat around the globe and on every vital issue, enriching Times editorials and becoming critical to our understanding. Carol, I've sort of had you come up here while I was saying these things, but you'll come up now, please. I, I won't. So I was really glad to hear um, Secretary Baker's remarks, and they've made me more hopeful, but they will only have impact if people listen to his advice, and it would really be useful if his remarks could be more widely disseminated. Um, he is obviously correct in pointing to President Bush and his importance to the success of Baker's tenure. But uh, typically, um, the secretary underplayed uh, his own contributions, including the fact that he, he had an acute understanding of the politics of diplomacy and a steely determination for making sure he got from A to Z with uh, the kind of achievement that would benefit the country. He surrounded himself with an extraordinary cadre of experienced and professional senior aides. And as he mentioned, he truly believed in American leadership. Whenever I went anywhere with him, uh, people always knew he spoke for the president and he was the man to talk to. I had the fortune to travel with him throughout his tenure. When I was seven months pregnant, we went to Paris so he could meet with uh, Chen Chi Chen. A couple of days after I returned from maternity leave, uh, we were off to the NATO capitals to discuss important issues. Uh, sometimes it was an inconvenience. Flying into Rome one night on another trip, I was looking forward to having a eating pasta at a restaurant with some of my colleagues. But alas, as we were landing, Secretary Baker decided to announce that he was divesting his Citibank stock, which meant I had to write the story urgently. I was working for Reuters at the time. So I ended up having a cheese sandwich in the press room. But the amazing experiences that I had with him were things that, uh, you know, stay with you all your life. Being in Moscow when he was trying to nudge Gorbachev to a peaceful transition of systems from communism to whatever exists now. Um, <laughs> that wasn't in expected at the time. Um, and also going to Chelyabinsk um, in the former Soviet Union. He was the first Secretary of State to visit this nuclear facility. We arrived and there were all these nuclear scientists at the windows, you know, uh, just in, in, 
I think some of them were terrified about what, what it meant that an American Secretary of State was now coming into the sanctum, the nuclear sanctum of the Soviet Union. So I, uh, he, he wasn't as forthcoming as I always wanted him to be. No public official ever is. But I learned a lot from him. And in, for, in fact, I learned a lot from every Secretary of State I covered, beginning with Schultz, and from many of you in this room. Uh, who have spent your lives formulating American policy, executing it, advancing America's interest, and more often than not, were willing to share your insights and your expertise with me. That intellectual generosity and commitment to truth-telling has been most important and valued more than you will ever know over the past 11 years during my tenure with the New York Times editorial board when we tried to shape the debate on international issues in a responsible way. That meant going beyond the facts to try and point the way towards constructive policies on Iran, North Korea, Syria, Saudi Arabia, China, Russia, nuclear weapons, and many more. Readers didn't always agree with us. You didn't always agree with us. But we have tried to make people think. It will come as no surprise to hear that, like so many others, including Secretary Baker, I am deeply worried about the future of our institutions and principles that undergird our democratic system. A State Department that is critical, as critical to our national security as the Pentagon, yet is often misunderstood and is being hollowed out. An America that has lost its way as the leader of the Western Alliance and the um, exponent of liberal democracy. And a press that is under attack in perhaps the most existential way ever. So in these embattled times, an award like this assumes greater importance, not just as a recognition of, the, of Pam and myself, but as an affirmation of the Academy's enduring belief in the role of journalism in a free society. Americans are unlikely to support any federal policy, certainly not complex national security issues, if they don't understand the reasoning behind the policies. And for better or worse, um, where we stand as journalists, all of us are flawed, but most of us are very well-intentioned, is critical to that understanding. So thank you um, very deeply for this award and to Arthur Ross for his generosity uh, for this honor. Um, we, we all have to stay engaged. It's never been more important. Thank you. Well, it is my duty to tell you that we have managed once again to actually conclude on schedule. And I can return to you three and a half minutes of your day. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to our awardees. Thank you, Carol and Pam, for meaningful statements. Thank you, Doug, for being here. Please do tell your father how much we appreciated his talk. And thank you all, friends and colleagues, for thank you both Thompson sisters for being here with us as well. Uh, and thank you all my colleagues and friends for being here and supporting us. And I return to you the balance of your day. Thank you. Thank you.